thank you very much indeed, Nicholas, for that warm introduction. And uh, good morning, everybody. Um, it, it, Nicholas made me sound like I was terribly busy and running around like a lunatic, um, which is not, not entirely fair. And I'm very, very delighted to be here this morning uh, talking to Mark, um, who I am going to give a little introduction to, um, just to, to kind of set the scene a little for, for some of the conversations that I hope we'll, we'll have. Um, as, as Nicholas says, one of the, one of the best loved, most prolific composers of his generation. Um, residences and associations at a huge range of different organisations, the CBSO, English National Opera, which is when Silver Tassi was written, uh, BBC Symphony Orchestra, the LPO, Chicago Symphony Orchestra, um, and work with some of the leading uh, interpreters of the time, Simon Rattle, Yurovsky, Papano, Marc-Andre Hamelin, the Nash Ensemble, the London Sinfonietta, uh, John Schofield, Pete Erskine, and a host of others across um, what we would broadly define as jazz and classical, although perhaps that's also something we'll come back to. Um, Mark was awarded a CBE in the Queen's Birthday Honours in 2015. He's won Southbank Awards and Olivier Awards for his works, and he's a research fellow in composition at the Royal College of Music. And indeed, we are between two big premieres because it was just a couple of weeks ago that the world premiere of the Martland Memorial was given um, with Colin Curry and Britain Piers Orchestra under Marin Allsop at the Royal Festival Hall in memory of Steve Martland and in June uh, the Berlin Philharmonic and Simon Rattle will premiere Remembering in memory of Evan Schofield um, who's, who's father you work with. Actually, was done with the USO ah I see okay yeah. Yeah. Sorry, um, yeah. <laughs> so, so, two, so two big memorial pieces yeah. this yeah. year. Um, I want to, to kind of start at the beginning a little bit. Yeah. Um, and I, actually, the first question I was going to ask you was about learning at the RCM. But given that before we started, we, one of the things that came up was, was pianists in church when you were little. Um, I, tell, tell us about when, when you first got involved in music and when you first started to compose, even before RCM enters the yeah, picture. Yeah, it's quite similar to a lot of composers. I know how many composers here, but I do hear this, this um, tale quite a lot, is that I, I was forced, which I'm very pleased about now by my parents to play the piano. <laughs> um, I'm not sure what I think about that, especially having <coughs> four kids now, <coughs> and especially young kids, it's, it's a tricky one, that, but I am grateful now. But I did find practicing really boring. I wasn't a particularly good pianist. I never, I think, I thought I was very good at when I was younger, and then until I went to junior department of Royal College and realized I was very, very average. But I used to do things, <coughs> I got quite obsessed, but also, I think that I found practicing really boring, so I used to distort the piano pieces I had to, to practice <laughs> out of boredom, which is a way of starting composition, actually. It's quite interesting that, that I think quite a few people have <clears throat> talked about this. Yeah. So I, I um, never knew how to write it down, and that was the, the other thing is I was, I was actually quite slow at learning music theory. Uh, it's funny when, when I meet people and they say, oh, I find music, you know, writing music out really tricky. And I forget how tricky I found it um, when I was, you know, seven, eight, nine, and probably didn't do too well. I mean, I passed exams, but, but <clears throat> what it meant is that I had a, quite a sophisticated um, oral thing because of, because of, because of improvising and, and playing, by, you know, without reading the music, although I could read music basically, um, which meant I wrote a lot of things like symphonies, and I was very ambitious. I had a whole work list of what I was going to do in the future. And it was like opus numbers, which went up to 150. Wow. <laughs> and it was like symphonic poems. But seriously, you could never play these pieces. They're, they're, they're also, the other thing, because I wasn't very good at theory, a lot of the semiquavers and demi semiquavers didn't add up in the bar. <laughs> so, um, so I've got, the, I think they're in my parents' loft. And, and, and they're, 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 it was like an ambition. So I was like quite obsessed with writing music down. And I was also obsessed with being a composer. It was very strange. And my school friends found it odd. Um, although I never got bullied. I think they thought there was something... I, very, I don't know quite how I avoided being bullied, but really, because I, I, was, I think I was quite an irritating child. Um, <laughs> no, I really mean it. I just think I was a bit odd. And, and, and I, you know, I was obsessed. I used to have, like... Um, I also remember things like... I used to write down who was my top ten of, of um, classical composers, and it varied every week, and I'd bring out a new list. And it's just very strange thinking back, but I, I don't know, I just, I just, I really, because there was nobody in my family, because none of my family did, went to further education, both my parents just worked from 16, and <clears throat> so I had no role models in that way, so I was a bit of a freak, um, and my cousins thought I was a freak, you know, so it was, it was strange, but I sort of, 
I suppose I played on that. I, I pretended my middle name was Wolfgang. That's <laughs> it. No, I did. And so I lied about the things. I actually lied about various things. I used to sign things, really. So it was very strange. I mean, it was, it was real delusions of grandeur, I know. But, <laughs> but um, so I, I was a very odd child in that way. But I, I think the, the, the thing that I recognise now is that I was obsessed. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what quite a lot of creative, you know, not just musicians, composers, but, you know, writers. And I, I got very obsessed with being a composer. Yeah. But was it the... I, I'm really fascinated by this, this, this writing down, because that's something Britton used to do when he was very yeah. little, wasn't, wasn't it? He would, he would write yes. down... The, the kind of... The, the visual aspect of notation was something that fascinated him, even if he didn't really understand what the yeah. dots and lines were about. It's the same. Um, so when you were composing these pieces earlier on, were you, were you improvising them and then writing them down, or were you simply about the, the putting them on the manuscript paper? No, I was improvising, but I didn't write them down accurately. Oh, so I if see. you played them back, it was sort of gobbledygook. And that's the problem, is that I, th 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 this is a big problem with composers, is that, is, is that your oral imagination is just getting that right and just trying to sort of translate that to the paper. I mean, it's still a problem in a way. Um, I mean, obviously, I've got much more sophisticated about it and I can do it a lot better, but there are certain things where you, you imagine things and it's hard to always get them down. Um, mm. I'm, I'm not thinking about music all the time. For instance, I'm not at the moment thinking about a piece. Well, I'm actually in between things a, a bit, but... Um, so you can switch off, but I think when you're younger as well, you... you that's the other thing about obsession. But I, I, I just didn't have the technical means. Um, and, and that was because I wasn't academic. I wasn't very good at school. I haven't got enough qualifications to work in a bank or, or anywhere, really. I mean, there's this a funny thing about teaching at the Royal College of Music as a professor is I feel a bit of, I feel a, bit of a fraud because I haven't really got enough qualifications to do this, <laughs> in, in a sense. But that, that's, that's a really interesting thing because I, I just really concentrated. I mean, I could tell you at the age of probably 9, 10, almost everybody's birth, uh, composer's birth date and death when they died. I could reel them off like that. I can't even do that now, actually, but I knew everybody, pretty much, of the, of the famous composers. Yeah. And, it, and, and my friends at school used to sort of, like, just... It was one of their sort of, like, tr you know, tricks that I could do. I could play the piano and then, and then recite all these, these dates, which is sort of just weird. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good party trick. Yeah, but I can't do it now, so... <laughs> <laughs> And, and so you, at what point did you think that, that going to the college to, to study was, was the right kind of path? It's f interesting because I played, um, my parents were very religious um, and I played the organ in church. I wasn't a particularly good organist, but I sort of could play for, for services. Mm. And um, this was in Essex and um, I was very lucky because there was a guy that played, there was like three organists, I was one of sort of like the third organist uh, um, playing. And, it's, and the, the other two, um, including Andrew Clark, because there's the guy that really encouraged me, was very, you know, very good organist. And, but he was, he was actually studying at the Royal College of Music. And he was very, very good to me. And he's, he went into the junior department of Royal College and said, I've got this kid, um, would you audition him? And so through him, and it wasn't even in, like, it was the wrong time, a year. It was like, I think I auditioned in, in December or something for, and got in in January. And I got in. And that was sort of amazing because I did actually have, uh, a, and this is another aspect of my childhood, a lot of discouragement at school. I had a teacher who, who was very actively against me, hmm. which is also another thing that I come across. Maxwell Davis had similar things when I spoke to him about this and he's talked about it publicly but I uh, had this fortunately I had a guy this guy Andrew Clark and an English teacher at school called Keith Houghton who who really believed in me but my parents were great my parents totally believed in me so that was you know family but outside of of you know like a family situation mm -hmm. and so um I just had a lucky break really I got to, I think I went to junior park when I was 14 um and by stroke of luck, um, I started studying. Uh, Ollie Nusson joined in two, uh, when I was 16, so I studied with him, and I was that was it really for me. So, uh, so, so, so college was sort of because of this friend who was already. Was, I think he was in the second year of college, Andrew Clark. And did you did you study major composition, as it were, when you got to senior college, or was piano still a, an active, a big active part of? What well, you when were? I went to junior department, and that's when I realised I wasn't particularly good. Although before that, I used to like, practice at six hours a day or something ridiculous like that. But I never got that much better. And then when I got to, <laughs> when I got to uh, 
Royal College, I realised, and then that's where I sort of did joints. So, so um, I actually did, it's, this is another thing which is quite funny, I, I actually did a really good, uh, I went for a scholarship which I didn't get from college, but um, so when I finished with Ollie Nusson, mm. I did, a, I, for some reason I played really well in the, in the audition, and they gave me Yu Chun Yi, it was like one of the top piano teachers, and then when I went to him, he couldn't quite work out why. <laughs> <laughs> He was so lovely, but he never quite... He, he thought, how did you... Yeah, I must have just did, like, a freak thing. <laughs> so, that I, so, so then, I, then he realised I, I was concentrating, so I didn't really... That was my second study, which you could do automatically then. Yeah. And, and, and um, so piano then deteriorated so much so that I even had some of the... You know, you had to do your piano exam. I had a couple of the uh, professors sniggering when I sort of played things. <laughs> There's one guy, I think Sue Stark might know who that was, who was particularly... Um, Rude in, in my uh, in my exam, but anyway, that's so the piano sort of went Took by the by, really, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it was quite prominent up until I was eighteen. And then, and at that point, then it's it's composition that takes centre stage, yeah. and John Lambert. Yeah, for four be years. Becomes your I went teacher. through the same route as Ollie Nusson actually. I pretty much did because um, I was with Oliver Nusson, although I still had lessons after mm. I started at college. Um, he studied with John Lambert and he studied with Gunther Schiller in America and I did exactly the same. So I went sort of his route really because of um, his recommendation from him. And did you have the chance, when you were at the college, did, was a lot of your music performed? Did you have, the, I mean, presumably there was the, the opportunity to work with a lot of musicians and therefore test things. <laughs> it wasn't so great then, it's much better now. Um, I didn't have much played at college. I had more things played outside of college. There wasn't so many opportunities. Um, for having things done um, and I was lucky again because of the contacts. So the other thing about when I studied with Ollie is that, that him being in a profession meant that I just met everybody at the age of 16. Mm. You know, I know, um, you know, Simon Brainbridge, Robert Saxton, all those composers who are coming up, Judith Weir. Mm. <coughs> and I've known them since, Colin Matthews particularly, <coughs> who's a great friend. I've known them since I was 16. So it's, <clears throat> it's an advantage, I think, in terms of, you know, whereas you get to know those people quite often when, you, when you're 22 and, and even later. Um, <clears throat> so that's... Sorry, I forgot what you're thinking. Having, having, well, having them in your life, but that's, that's yeah. an extraordinary thing. So, yeah. um, and indeed, because Oliver Nusson's recorded a lot of your music, right? Yes, and yes. And performed an awful lot of your music. So did you find that Tanglewood then offered you the opportunity to have more kind of hands-on experience because it was it was Charlotte and, and Hans Werner Henser yeah, at Tanglewood. Yeah, I suppose so. I mean, I was, I was just lucky because um, I, I got f taken up by the Society of Promotion of New Music, um, which I don't even know what... I mean, I'm not involved in that anymore, but they, 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 um, they gave me my first break, really. I had a wind quintet played and then I had Night Dance, which was an early piece. And really, that's where everything sort of escalated from then. I got a commission for the London Sinfonietta. That was, all, that was actually after Tanglewood. Um, what Tanglewood w gave me, <coughs> if, in terms of American contact, is that I met a lot of players who are now playing in American orchestras. So if I go and work with Chicago or Boston, I know quite a few players. And I mean, not the whole orchestra, because mm. obviously young people coming up, but people my generation, it could be five or six people, which, which is a real advantage when you're starting to rehearse because you have people that are on your side. And so, so Tangwood really opened it up more sort of internationally f for me, because um, you're only there like two months. And that was really the only post-grad I did. Mm. But, um, but the thing about Ollie before that, because of course he went to Tangwood, is that, that, that what he did, and this I can never underestimate, because I, I, because of what happened to me at school, with this teacher, who should remain nameless, who's still um, alive, and is in contact with all my teachers actually, and still aggressively against me, um, which is really amazing actually. I heard one comment recently that he told me he should have told me really. I dragged it out of him, um, but I had no confidence. And 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 Ollie used to say to me, "Why, you know?" Because I used to write things. I remember I took one of the first things I took to him was a sort of very bad a version of Meistersinger Overture. I was really obsessed with Wagner about that age. And, and he looked at me and he said, why are you so not, why, you know, you are a composer. You will be a composer. I have total confidence. I mean, he, he was amazing. I mean, he just, he just saw that in me. And, and it, was, it was a personal thing in a way. And I, I, as a teacher, I still find this remarkable because I'd never done this to any of my students. But, you know, he, we became friends. And, you know, he, I, my parents didn't have a telephone, for instance. And I used to go to a phone box and phone him up every day. And he used to reverse the charge. I used to reverse the charges and he phoned me for like an hour and talked me through composition. He said to me, 
you, you are a composer, you will be played by major orchestras in America, I'm totally convinced. And I thought, how does he know that at 16? But to have that, when you have a teacher who's against you, to have this incredible belief, you can't underestimate just so, I'm not, I, would, I wouldn't be here now if it wasn't for Ollie. So it, it really goes to show the importance of, of mentorship totally. and, and, yeah, and support yeah. when you're... Because it's, it's a strange thing to do, to write music in a way, and it's quite a... Especially from my background. And, and you know, <clears throat> the one argument, of course, you could have, and this is another thing that Maxwell Davis said, is that, that if you have opposition, um, and, of course, it's, you should never recommend that for anybody, it does toughen you up a little bit. Mm. So I, did, I was more toughened for the profession when you get the knockbacks, like the bad reviews and certain things that happen to you. I'm a bit more equipped, or I was a bit more equipped in my early 20s to deal with that. Mm -hmm. Very, very interesting. And you mentioned the first work uh, that was a wind quintet. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I was sort of look, looking through the, the, your work list... It's not the, there, by the way, anymore. I've withdrew it. No, no, it's, no, it's, not, it's not in the work list. It's OK, yeah. it's not in the work no, list. No, no. Um, but noticeably, the, the, the <laughs> earlier pieces, there's a real prominence of, of reeded wind instruments. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, indeed, of, of, yeah. of amplified instruments as well. So mm. was that a conscious kind of seeking out of a different kind of sonority from very no. string-heavy, or was it just...? No, it's because I didn't know anything about string instruments. Ah, OK. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and also, um, I wish... This is another regret that I have, that I wished I'd learned a string instrument when I was a kid. Hmm. I think it's really important for composers to learn a string instrument in a way, because it's so... I mean, I, learned the, I played the flute, so anything wind lines are comfortable. So mm. if, um, sometimes even now I meet a player and they say something about the flute part and they don't know I was a flute player because it's not in a bio or anything. And then they go, oh, right, that makes sense that I can write really well for the flute or wind, you know, because of the fingering and so clarinet, all yeah. those instruments. So I think because I felt that it was like my comfort zone, I, was, I, I definitely write better for those instruments. And I've had to work very hard, at particularly the string instruments, particularly cello, which I love very much. Um, and I think that I've got better, but it's taken a long time. But I just wished even the basic, you know, like even talking about Britain, he played the viola, mm. quite a lot of, you know, there's a lot of, lot of big history of composers playing, you know, even just basically playing, getting around an instrument. So I, I and, and so I'm encouraging my, my kids to all play string instruments because it's important. That, that must make for an interesting yeah. cacophony <laughs> yeah, when does, they're yeah. all practicing at yeah, the same yeah. time. Um, remembering my own terrible violin playing when mm. I was little. Um, well, at least you did it. It's great. I did, mm. yes. I think my parents were delighted when I gave it up. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, and, and what about the um, bringing in electric guitars, bringing in jazz kits and so on into, yeah. into composition? Was that something that you had... Because I, I noticed that talking about when you're, you know, when you're kind of in your single digits and early teens, you're talking very heavily about classical music. Yeah, well, it wasn't allowed. I wasn't allowed to listen to it. And that's the thing that's interesting to me because it was forbidden. And I think when anything's forbidden, to, especially to a child, yeah. it becomes much more interesting. So I never grew up with... Um, I mean, I think I remember my mum talking about the Beatles and she said, oh, you just step on them. <laughs> she actually said that. <laughs> she hated them so much. She thought they were completely... They were, like, corrupting. So, uh, that, so if you're told that... And I didn't know... I knew some Beatles tracks, but... And I'm, I'm still actually not a great fan, funny enough. I don't know if that's really influenced <laughs> me, but um, I think what happens is that, that when I got to my re sort of more rebellious things, you know, which go with drinking and stuff, I suddenly, I suddenly found pop music. I didn't like pop music so much, but I liked black soul music. And I had friends that went to clubs when I was 16, 17. I looked very young for my age at that age as well, so I, I couldn't really get in anywhere. So by the time I was 18... I was going to those, and I then, cause through soul music, and particularly sort of um, fairly commercial soul music, like Herbie Hancock at the time, because a lot of those really great jazz players were dabbling, I then found out about Miles Davis, and then I found out about jazz. And then I became, funny enough, it coincided with start finishing with Ollie Nusson and starting at Royal College of Music, I became completely obsessed with jazz, the history, um, just all the players. I mean, I couldn't believe it, because it was a thing that... Um, that, my, that, that I didn't know anything about. It turned out that my mum actually secretly had a passion for jazz and went to a clubs when, I, when she was before she had kids, which slightly annoyed me because I thought well, she could have told me. <laughs> but anyway, I'm, I'm sort of glad, I'm glad in a way. But, but then, so what happens, I became obsessed with jazz. And I think because my first compositions my, that I recognise are around, well, sort of 1920, um, a lot of them are 
things are withdrawn. I think that that coincided with my real interest in jazz, and so maybe that's why it's stuck, mm. that, that, I, that I wanted to incorporate, but I didn't know how to do it when I was younger. But it became, that became an obsession. I'm, 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 I'm still interested in jazz, but less so. But I, but I just had to know everything about it, you know, right back to Big Spider back and even, you know, really early on. Um, and so in, up to, up to, so I, I, I really like a lot of, I'm um, quite a broad taste in that way. And incorporating improvisation as well, because I think Blood on the Floor is the first yeah. piece that has improvisation yeah. in it. That was tricky because, um, well, improvisation interested me because of what I talked about earlier about, about distorting piano pieces. I, I was fascinated because actually, if you think about it, I mean, I could be wrong here because I don't know what courses, new courses there are, but certainly when I was younger, improvisation was other than organists. Mm -hmm. Good organists were taught improvisation and that's what I did. I used to improvise it when I was in church and that was nice because you, you felt quite relaxed. But I was never really taught improvisation, but I did it as part of my composition. So them meeting jazz players, I was fascinated by the fact they could improvise and write sort of as they were playing. And, um, but the thing is that, that, that if you've grown up, if you grow up in a sort of world, you know, especially when I was in my early sort of, well, early 20s, and, and even my time at college, it was very much the, uh, the avant-garde orthodoxy. So it was Boulez, Stockhausen, um, Berio, mm. all those composers, and Arkis. I mean, I, I was obsessed with those composers, particularly at that age. And of course, in a way, jazz wasn't really approved of. And so it was a real, almost like a party line. And I loved, I did love a lot of that, I still love a lot of that music, but it, it was, it was so, it was a weird thing that like I was writing music that was quite meticulously written down. So, you know, uh, almost to the point where, you know, you, you, so much articulation, so many dynamics. It was really, so, I mean, I'm still a bit like that. I can't, and so to let go and have a player improvising was, was quite a moment. So it took me to, well, I wrote Blood on the Floor in my mid thirties. Mm. So it took me a good 15 years after I was obsessed with jazz to really even work with jazz players. Cause that's the other thing is that it's still quite a divided world. And the difference between the time when Gunther Schuller, for instance, my teacher was working in jazz is that a lot of players now that I work with can read anything. You know, I work with John Patitucci, the great bass player, and he can read anything. Pete Erskine, the drummer, can read anything. So you've got this advantage that they play with great feel and, and they're great players, but also you can put anything in front of them. So it, it sort of makes a scope. So, but, but the improvisation, improvisation is still a tricky thing to let go and give a certain amount of time for them to, to, to improvise over what I'm writing. Yeah, and, it's, and I, I, I agree, unless you are an organist, it's not necessarily something that's part of your classical training. And I, yeah. uh, there, was a, there was an interview a few months ago um, on the World Service with Gabriella Montero, yeah. um, who is a, an astoundingly talented pianist and who yes. was talking about how yeah. she had um, been told as part of her conservatoire training, because she used to improvise a great deal uh, when she was a teenager, yeah. that if she was going to be a serious classical pianist, then she must not improvise. Um, yeah. Because that was not part of what was expected, and it was only yeah. much later that Martha Argerich said to her, yeah. "Why aren't you improvising? You're really good at it." Yes, and um, other, yeah, and the other thing, of course, is that you, a hundred or well, two hundred years ago, you'd have been doing it. Ex exactly. So that's exactly. so it's sort of sort of a nonsense. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, and she is she is a wonderful improviser. I I mean I, I commend to you if she if she's doing a piano recital anytime soon. She did an amazing Wigmore Hall concert not long ago, where the first half was sort of standard repertoire, if you like. The second half. Was, was improvisations, and she said, anybody in the audience can give me something that they would like me to improvise on, but the quid pro quo is, if you want me to improvise on the melody, you have to stand up and sing it. Wow, how fascinating. And they did. Wow. And it completely changed the atmosphere of the space. Yeah, so, um, yeah. yeah, a really, really, really yeah. interesting player. Um, given that kind of, I, I want to, I want, I'd like to talk a little bit about the, about the stage works, but to slightly hop ahead, given that we've spoken about the, the jazz modernist brick wall a yeah, little bit. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I found um, very interesting about the, uh, the New Grove Dictionary of Music and Musicians biography oh. of you oh, right. God, I think, I uh, by, by Jonathan Cross is that um, 
the, the, talking about uh, the uh, hammered out the orchestral study for oh, yeah. Nicole, <laughs> he says, yeah. he says, and, and I, I'll quote this because it's the phrasing he uses that I found very interesting. Hammered out an orchestral study for Anna Nicole, premiered at the BBC Proms in 2010, took as its basis the R&B hit Single Ladies, put a ring on, it, ring on it, 2008, by American singer Beyonce, a reference recognised instantly by younger members of the audience, but which amusingly was not spotted by the numerous classical music critics present. Yeah, one way to really wind up <laughs> critics. <laughs> Um, and I didn't do that on purpose. No, but, but yeah. I mean, it, is, is it amusing? I mean, I find it really interesting that he's, he's kind of... He's pointed at it as being Yeah, I didn't... It funny, wasn't... But yeah, but it wasn't deliberate, and I don't... I wasn't trying to be clever. It was, mm. sort of, it was just a natural thing to do. I was a bit... I should have gone on, talked about it more than it was based... I mean, that was my fault, really. But I don't know, I just thought that it was, it was all blown out. I mean, it's, it, it, was, it, was, it was quite interesting how people latched on to that, but... But, you know, again, I don't know how many young people, especially classical people, mm. would have known it. But, yeah, more, more days, because more people... I think younger generation, if you talk to the Royal College, for instance, mm. they will know more about Beyonce than maybe when I was younger, people were a bit more separated. So there's a bit broader. It's like your CD collection, you know. Um, I don't have a classical section and a jazz section. So, I mean, it's all alphabetical. Mm. Um, so, you know... I don't know, uh, Miles Davis is next to Maxwell Davis. So, you know, things like that. So, so I think people are a bit more... I think that people are less uptight about it. And it's the same way that things are more acceptable. You know, you can have Arvo Pear and you can have Lackerman yeah. being totally respected. And I don't think it was like that in the 70s. So, so, so that in that way, what he's talking about is, is, is it's more of a relaxed... Like, but I wasn't doing it... To obviously to, to piss off no, critics. No, no. <laughs> yeah, um, it's a very it's, dangerous it's thing. The, I suppose it's it's interesting that the the, the language that goes with um, laying what were you know laying these different genres next to each other, the language that goes with it is still quite often very charged around yeah. high yeah. and low and, and so on. And yeah. Um, and yeah, I think generally there's there's much greater eclecticism in people's listening yeah. habits now. But, but how you're right. we discuss that is something. That yeah, and I mean I never thought I don't like that term low and high, <coughs> high art as well. Um, and it's something that Louis Andreessen, the great Dutch composer, talks about. And I think that that. Um, but the thing is that what I'm trying to do in a way with the jazz pieces is is trying to make it integrated. Mm. And try not to think, you know, I mean, what, what I hope, and a few pieces, I wrote a piece for Dave Holland called Bass Inventions, and, and half of that is improvised and half of it's written down for him. And I wanted it to be seamless, so you wouldn't know, you know, you couldn't quite tell. And I like that idea, that, 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 so, so, so it's not to sort of, um, I mean, in a way, I just think, and I love somebody like, Michael Tippett, I love his music, but sometimes he used jazz and it's sort of, it's almost like a tourist, he's sort of going through that bit. And, yeah. he's, and it's not quite integrated. Yeah, it's and it's very sweet, because it still sort of sounds like him. But, but I think, I, because I went in from an, uh, an age where it really sort of, I got absorbed it, and that's what the jazz players that I work with say, that it's not just stuck on. Um, so, I mean, you know, it, it is sometimes, I think. I don't always achieve it, but when, it, when the best things I think I've done, where it works, there is an integration. But, you know, I, th I don't like to talk about that too much because then it becomes quite self-conscious. Mm. So it's a sort of natural thing I just do. I like, I choose jazz players because I like the sound as well. It's not just because, you know, it's, and they play fantastically. But mm. the, the downside of writing these pieces for jazz players is, of course, I have had a few times where the wrong player's been picked, like for Blood on the Floor. And then it does sound like a mismatch. So the player is not really the right type of player. So that's, that's always the way. But it's the same in jazz in a way, is that, you know, if you get, get, can get a mismatch. So, and I'm not in control of that all the time. I'm very in control of first performances and premieres. I can choose absolutely, you know, I think is right. You know, when I worked with John Schofield, mm. he was absolutely right because uh, the sound, and we talked, and we had a lot of similarities, although from different backgrounds, um, especially musically. Um, we had a, we sort of things about, technical things about, Harmony were very close in the way you spaced chords, and I was really surprised at that. But that was just that, and I thought, well, that's why I'm attracted to his playing because there's things that, you know, are quite similar to me. Yeah, but personal connection between between players and, and yeah, the yeah, it's very, it's very important, and I guess yeah. that there is that, and and perhaps we'll come to this in a, in a minute. Um, when something is published, then it is a letting go of control. Yeah. Um, 
which is which must be in some cases quite frustrating if what then happens to your baby as it were is not quite what you yeah would but you can't do you can't get too possessive about it i mean that's you know, i know you said you can talk about opera but you know there are composers and i think britain was a bit like this um that, that could get very offended if you go too far away from i i think that if a piece is going to work you should i mean i like people doing um going away from stuff you know like when when we did Anna Nicole Richard Jones the fabulous director he pretty much ignored every single stage direction we put in the score <laughs> seriously but he came up with better ones and that's the different thing you know but composers do get very funny about that and I, I think well you know it, it's not yours anymore it's gone you know and of course you can get bad performances and you can get players that are wrong but that's that's happens to everybody really mm. so you can't get too worried about it so I don't really um and I, and I think it's the same with a lot of composers I don't listen to older pieces almost at all ever um because you just you just it's just about then what you're writing now mm -hmm. and, and you have to go in here and that's the other thing that is tricky is if you're in the middle of writing a new piece and then you have to go and hear a piece you wrote three years ago or five years ago and that and of course it sounds like you're being ungrateful but it's sometimes very confusing mm -hmm. So I, 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 I do go, um, you know, not, not all the time, but <clears throat> quite often because I want to support, because I love players, I love, I love working, collaborating with players. It's my favourite thing to do. So I will go and do it, but it, it, it still can be a bit confusing. Mm. I, Mark and I were talking about Brahms earlier on because Brahms is, is my, my great love and research area and we, are share, we share Brahms I love. love. Brahms. I don't understand why people don't like <laughs> um, And there's, <laughs> there's, a, there's a very lovely story from, from the Brahms at the end of his life in the 1890s. A, a student string quartet went to visit him and played one of his string quartets to him because they wanted the opportunity to play to him and they were very nervous and they played the quartet and at the end they stopped and they sort of sat in panicked fear and Brahms said... That was very good. And then he said, and yesterday another string quartet came and played the same quartet to me, and it was completely different. And that was also very good. There you go. Fantastic. So, yeah. So uh, it's brilliant. <laughs> yeah, it says it all. So, so given that we've... Uh, it, Anna Nicole's come up a couple of times, yeah. but this, this whole question of, of collaboration, um, I, I, I find really interesting. And I, I was listening to the, uh, the World Service interview that you did when Silver Tassi was, oh, yeah, uh, yeah. was premiered. And there's this extraordinary... You can, you can still get it on iPlayer, this extraordinary um, kind of combined interview with you and Amanda Holden yeah. and Jerry Finley and yeah, Sarah okay. Conley and um, talking about their, their, their input into the piece. Yeah. And I was particularly struck by what sounded like a really um, intensive engagement that you and, and Amanda Holden, who, yeah. who put the libretto together, had of sort of dropping around each other's houses at five in the morning with the next verse yeah. and, and finishing things she off. She just lived very close to me, which did help, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> what's, it, what's it like putting something like that together? Because obviously there's a lot of kind of stakeholders, if you like, in putting together a, a big stage work like that. Well, a lot of trust. I really trusted Amanda. Um, she hadn't written a libretto before, but I knew, because she'd been translating mm, a lot mm -hmm. of operas, she knew what words would work. Um, and it was an adaption of the Sean O'Casey play. Um, and I think that... that, that I think I, re I remember how it happened, actually. I, I, met, I met her at a party, I think. Um, and I remember mentioning it to her and saying, oh, it's quite interesting, but I didn't know how, what, how to what to do mm. and then she literally went and did a treatment and, and stuck it through my door because she, she was two roads down from me and, and it was fantastic and, and that's when and so immediately I could see that she thought musically and, and the other thing about it and of course this gets very I've seen a few things recently where librettists get very upset about this is that, that it, it it's a tricky one because you have to compose, I mean, you know, in a way that, that, that you, you do hear about the librettists, of course, you, and they're really great librettists, you know, Mozart's librettists and mm. Puccini, and, you know, but you, the composer's really in control of, of the whole situation. And I think a lot of librettists get very upset and, and, and they get their ego bruised and because um, you're really messing around with the words. I mean, I'm, I'm, very, I, I'm very instinctive about setting words and if I don't like something, I will just say, and I say, I want that rewritten, I want... I mean, this happens all the time. And I think certain, you know, even, you know, to some extent, the greater the writer, certainly in playwrights, the harder it is to, to fix that because they get very... They, you know, quite rightly, they've worked very hard on their text and then you mess it around. But then, it, the, the, you know, a lot of... I think a lot of librettos read like plays and, and it would be great if you put them on the stage without the singers, but there's no thought... 
to how, what it would work like on, as a sing, you know, sung. And, and you can't blame them because they're not musicians quite a lot of the time. That was a bit different with Richard Thomas, for mm -hmm. Anna Nicole, because he is a composer and he does set words. And that was interesting because he did have more of an idea of what would work on stage. At the same time, when he was writing his words, he had different music in his I head. I was going to say, did you find that Yeah, yeah, on? and he was yeah. very amused by that because, of course, I'm so different from, from him. But with Amanda Holden, um, she just completely was wonderful in that way. I'd just say, I don't, that doesn't work. She'd go away and write another version. And that's what you need, really, because you need to, you know... Um, it's not that the libretto is not important, not important, but it's, it's just you need to get it right musically and I think and, and, and allow room for the music to come through. Mm. And you were involved in, in the libretto of Greek, were you not? Yeah, I co-wrote it. I, I, co -wrote wrote it. I wrote the first half was really me. And what was that like? Uh, well, I hadn't got a clue. I, just, <laughs> it's like, I mean, it was really scary. I mean, I, I did this thing where I remember going to Burkhoff, who wrote the play, um, with Henser, because Henser was... Um, sort of involved in, you know, he commissioned me. I remember going to like a dinner once and I had to play and I just literally scrubbed out, because you know, the, the play is very wordy and I just literally scrubbed out all these lines. I didn't even write a proper, I was writing it from literally the music from the play, from the, the copy of the play yeah. with, with the scrubbed out things, which is not, if you read about librettos and if you read books about, you know, it's really not a thing people did um so I, what Wagner did, well I, yeah but he wrote his own thing so I was, <laughs> but I mean but I think that I don't know I just thought it was so I was sort of scrabbling around when I wrote Greek um and lucky I met Jonathan Moore who was a playwright and a director as well mm. and he he fashioned the, the second act is really me and him together or mainly him actually mm. so so I've got a bit of experience but it, it was it was sort of sort of scrabbling around really with no when I was 26 when I when I started writing that I was not that long out of college and 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 the idea of opera scared me when he, when Henser asked me I thought I, I I really didn't imagine I'd ever write an opera which is very interesting especially now because to some extent certainly um not so much in England because people do maybe know about orchestral music but in Germany I would be known just as an opera composer mainly as an opera composer so so I I I've sort of I didn't stumble into it but it was a thing that I never envisaged that mm. I'd you know, I never grew up in opera for, with opera. My mum just played Beethoven symphonies and concertos and all totally instrumental music. Mm. And I think my first opera was, um, I went to see was Bohem at ENO. And then I saw Anjagin at Royal Opera, one of these proms things. They used to do yes. that thing where they used to take the seats out, which is amazing. So uh, they're the two operas that I got to know, but I didn't grow up with it. So when I got commissioned to write Greek, I had to like swat up on it all and find out about opera. So it was, uh, so I felt a bit of a fraud when I was doing it. But then again, of course, it gave me, then I wasn't sort of so intimidated. I was intimidated, but I sort of thought, well, I'll just do this. It's not going to work. No, it was, you know, and it was done in, it, we performed it in Munich in yes. Germany. I thought, well, if it doesn't work, then it's not going to damage my orchestral career because they're just going to, you know, forget about it. So, so it, it was, it was strange sort of not really, in, knowing enough and just sort of getting on with it. But drama, the dramatic, has become a big part of your output. And I mean, yeah. not, just, not just the operas, but um, <coughs> something like Twice Through the Heart, yeah. which, is, which is one of my, my favourite pieces, the, the, um, uh, the, the, the Jackie Kay poems. Yeah. Um, what, what strikes me looking at the, the kind of list of dramatic pieces is that so many of them have very, very contemporary resonances in terms of their content. So, mm. you know, Greek... Um, very much a commentary, social commentary on, on the 80s. Um, Twice Through the Heart is a setting of uh, a collection of Jackie Kay poems uh, based on the testimony of a real life victim of domestic violence who stabs her husband and then refuses to testify against him. Um, and is yeah. a, an extraordinary, very, very powerful piece which made me think actually of uh, Pagliacci, which is also based on oh, a yeah. newspaper report. Yeah, um, uh, the yeah. libretto of Pagliacci, Leon Cavallo, took from a, from a newspaper report. Um, and then and then Anna Nicole as well, yeah. um, all works that refer to either absolutely the time in which they've been written or some, an event that's happened only a couple of years previously because yeah. there's still sort of legal rumblings around the, 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 the Anna Nicole Smith family, aren't there even now, I think? Oh, you mean going on for the court thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Not with me, I hope. No, no. <laughs> 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 Do you know something I don't know? <laughs> um, but the, is, is that a sort of... Is that a... a, a a conscious act on your part to pull opera more towards 
the now rather than... Well, it's not really sort of... It, it, what it is is I'm not stimulated by by things that are sort of 100 years ago, I'm afraid. I just, it has to be contemporary or, or ish. I mean, Silver Tassie is as far back yeah. as I'd go, really. It has to be something, and that was, the, the reason Silver Tassie appealed to me is that I had two grandfathers in the First World War. Oh. So I had a family, they Personal both survived family. the First World War, but I still grew up with stories. So it, 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 so, so it impacted my life. So all these things are sort of, yeah, are very much part of my life. And I think that I can only really, I only find it just being stimulated by that. I mean, I know that certain composers have that thing, and I, I really admire that in a way. Like they'll do a 16th century or, or a 15th century folk tale or something like that. And I can see why that's attractive, but it, it, it wouldn't interest me long, for long enough. I found with Anna Nicole, for instance, and, you know, there's a lot of controversy about that, but the more that Richard Thomas and I went into the sort of researching it, the richer the subject became. Mm. So it is interesting that, you know, there's just so many things you could have put in that opera that they've got left out and, and I, I think because they're so relevant in a way and still are about celebrity and about all that stuff <coughs> and about male you know stuff which is you know yep. obviously in twice of the heart yeah indeed but I, I the, the funny thing about the drama thing is because I never written music for theatre I've never written music for film um, and people say well how did you well I, I do remember funny enough uh, this goes back to my school schooling that I, that I did quite a lot of music for dramas at, at sixth form. Mm -hmm. I did some Victorian melodramas particularly. And I think actually, ironically, that, that stood me in great stead for, for writing for theatre, well, writing for operas, because I had this, I think, you, you know, I do think that composers, and there are quite a few of them, you know, uh, you know George Benjamin being one of them, Tom Addis, um, uh, Ollie Nusson, um, various people, uh, and they're talking about the English composers now, but they have like a real gift for drama. And I think you have to have that, because I think the trouble is that I think there's quite a few feelings that, that, that you write the music you write for the, for the concert hall and then put it on stage, and it just doesn't work. You have to have that. You know, but it's an instinct as well. And so I think that when Henser commissioned me for Greek, I think he saw a little bit through various things, although I'd written, written very little for voice. And I do find it hard to write for voice. It doesn't come naturally to me. So, but maybe that's why you know, I have to work harder, which is not a bad thing. <laughs> to get compiled. I get all my students, if they say, oh, I hate writing for the bassoon, I go, right, you're going to write a 10-minute piece of the bassoon. Because <laughs> you, you, know, you can't do that. You know, you've got to, you know, as a professional composer, you have to... You've got your uh, toolkit. Of yeah, course, and you've got yeah. to, sort of, challenges are good. One last question, and then I'll uh, see if there are any questions in the room, and I think we have some, some roaming mics, as it were. So uh, do be thinking if you have something to ask, but just one last thing. Yeah. Um, and, and that is... Um, both in terms of the number of works that you've written that are texted, but also the number of works that have descriptive titles in some yeah. way. There's a, there's a lot of pieces that are yeah. art-inspired, yeah. Bacon and Betts and so on, um, and a lot that have a poetical element. Yeah. And you, you mentioned in an interview a little while ago that um, generally there is something that underpins most of your work that may be artistic or poetic, even if you don't then yeah. make that public. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and when we were talking about Brahms beforehand, we were talking about the fact partly that he destroyed a lot of his um, sketches and things he didn't want posterity to rediscover, as it were. Yeah. So, I mean, musicologists of the future, looking at the, looking at the turnage yeah, I think both, yeah. archive, <laughs> <laughs> are, are there things that you would, that you would never want to be released? What does it... I mean, the idea of there being a Mark Antony turnage collected edition on somebody's shelf... In, <laughs> I mean, it's quite a few prompts that facial expression. Well, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, well, I mean, yeah, because you, it's difficult. I mean, I've withdrawn works. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, talking about twice the heart, there's a piece um, called Country of the Blind, which doesn't exist. Anymore. Well, it does exist, but you know, um, it's hard to completely get rid of something. Um, so I do. I'm quite careful if I really don't like a piece. Um, I haven't withdrawn more recently, which is I could be worrying. Is that my standards have sort of <laughs> changed or slipped? Um, or, or it's just you, maybe technically you get better, but the, 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 you know the pieces are. Less, but but I, I I do keep sketches, but that's mm -hmm. not necessarily. It's just for me because sometimes it's quite good to. Sometimes you have ideas and pieces that don't fit mm. into the piece you're writing at the moment, and I, and I think that happened. Well, that happened with Brahms. I'm pretty certain that we know that much. Yeah. That things started off. I think the second piano concerto was something else. I mean, the, the, I mean, you know, the, the, that does happen. So they're like a sort of treasure trove of things yes. you can. So that's why I keep them in a way, although I don't do it that often. 
Um, I have got pieces that I feel I, I, it doesn't quite work, but I'd like to redevelop it. Um, but then you can get too obsessed with doing that, and that's what Boulez tends to do, you know, re, re, just keep redoing the same 10 pieces. But, you know, so, I, I, so again, it's going back to what you feel is yours anymore. But um, the private things about, about well, I usually reveal the, um, the sources. It's funny that I, 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 I think the reason why I used a lot of paintings and, and poetry and stuff early on is, is it's, it's to get over the blank page thing of, mm. of you know, I always say even to students actually, if you really are stuck, I mean, I didn't, I mean, I'm quite fluent, so I don't get stuck very often, but um, the thing is to, if you've got something that's based on a poem, it does give you a sort of springboard to get over that first page. Quite often what I do is I would do pieces based on a certain poem or, or you know, something like that, or even prose, but mainly poem. Uh, and then I'd sort of almost forget about it because I'd, the ideas have started mm. and then they, they were just a springboard. So I might even set the first two verses of a poem um, which, not for soprano, but for, you know, instrument, you yeah. know, and take the, take the words away. But then, then I've got started. And then, of course, that is the, obviously the, the inspiration, the source of it. But then, so that's what's happened, probably. Mm. I've done that, and then I thought, well, there's no point, really, because it's not really about the whole poem. It's just about the beginning of it. So yeah. you could reveal it, but, you know, sometimes... You know, I, I remember that with Hensar. I was quite surprised at how many of his instrumental works were... were if he talked about them, were quite were sort of quite literary. He could write because he told me once that also if you got stuck um, to write things out in prose as well, describe a piece. Say the piece starts with this, and then and then just, and that was quite that can be quite liberating. So so it is so there's a lot of sort mm. of sort of um, so a lot of things are sort of just to get you started. Mm. Really interesting. Does anybody have any questions that they would like to ask Mark? So, lady here, there's somebody on the way with a microphone. You can see shadows way. moving in the background. Just down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's brilliant. There, yeah. Excellent. Hello. Hi. Um, I'm, I'm really curious with reference to some of my students who are very clearly very gifted musicians, but are very poor at reading music and have got no sense of theory at this stage, how you yourself got better at it? What, what particularly stimulated you to work on that side of well, things? Because, yeah, because the things were, if I started getting things played or, or, or even friends were playing it, it would not be what I envisaged. So I just, I just really just, 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 it's like with people doing maths GCSE, I know lots of people need that now, particularly actually, I know that from my older sons and, and you just have to do it. So really, I just, I mean, I, 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 it's weird, I'm not very, probably very patient anymore, because, and I should be, but the fact is I think that actually music theory isn't that hard to learn, really, compared with, say, for instance, maths, or even sort of, n not basic maths, but, you know, sort of like getting to, you know, 15, 15, 16-year-old, I think music theory is harder. So I think, and, but it's all very well for me, because I do that all the time, but I think that it, it is, and I know there's been a, quite a controversy about that, because there's something in The Guardian recently about, you know, musical, this, literacy. musical literacy, yeah. and I think it's essential because I, you know, as I said about these jazz players that I work with, they all read, I mean, really, really well, and it and it liberates them because I can write anything for them, and I think if they didn't, it's a, there's a limitation. Um, you know, I'm not saying that you, you know, there are great players in the in the history, especially of jazz and blues, who can't read a note, um, but they have a very acute musical sense. You know, they they can pictures and everything but I just think it's just worth persevering and I, and I think it is essential to get to that standard I mean there are things now like Sibelius the software and everything that that make it a lot easier I think to learn personally a teacher could do then to sort of help promote that yeah it's hard I don't know really I just think I don't really know what you're working from these days because I I'm sort of did it such a long time ago go but I, I think it can be very, very academic but um, seeing I think that things like duration and stuff like that is very hard for I think for kids but you know young kids to understand and I, I'm not sure if there are any sort of books and stuff mm. but I think that I mean the main th for me the, the where I got better is I looked at scores I actually read I, I would get a score 
you know, a little, you know, there's the Eulenberg scores and, and follow a, a CD or at that, that point a record. Um, and I think that really proved my ability to, to read music. So there's certain things, but I mean, it's just, you're just literally doing memory things, really, to be honest. And my daughter's playing the double bass and she's six and <laughs> literally she's just doing the E, you know, the elephant and all that, and gin and I can't remember what the gin? Gin? <laughs> yeah, I think it is. <laughs> Uh, every yeah, there's something with gin. There's a G string. I know. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. It's an interesting new yes. form of, <laughs> form of form of mnemonics there. Yeah. Sorry, I'm not. Really. <laughs> Ge uh, gentleman right at the back there, and then this gentleman down here. <coughs> the first piece I heard of yours was the Three Screaming Popes when yeah. I was at university. You've answered this question a little bit, but do you find any kind of collaboration, directly or indirectly, uh, your preferred method of writing? And does it bring out a particular voice in your creativity that maybe you wouldn't have expressed had it not been for that artwork or poetry or whatever? Yeah, possibly. I mean, it, it, <clears throat> it's a springboard, like I said, but, you know, I think that... that I mean, I'm still quite fond of that piece because I think it's quite... Ex <clears throat> I mean, it's a piece that I didn't... It's my first orchestral... Well, it's not my first orchestral piece, but first big orchestral piece. And I think that I... Um, that it made me sort of force it a little bit in the sen sense that, it, that, that those bacon paintings are quite expressionistic. And it made me do sort of a couple of extreme things in the orchestra, which, which, which I still can't believe I did in, in that <laughs> sense. So I think that, that, that it, it, did, it, it did push me. It did make me, I um, mean, it's not like a, you know, very avant-garde piece, but there are certain things in it that are quite sort of in your face. And I think that around that time, because I'd just written Greek, I had a lot of confidence because of Greek going really well. I think, I think that, I, and I really want, and I'd saved, I remember that was, a, that was a commission from the CBSO and Simon Rattle. And I remember I had that commission actually two or three years before the premiere of that. And I, but I wanted to save time. I, I mean, I wanted to save it up, not just rush it, because I knew it was a big deal. But I think that the yeah I suppose the painting I mean it's it's you know I, I the painting I read a lot of Bacon interviews at the time and I was very obsessed with Francis Bacon so I think it, it you know it for me it did it did push me. Okay. Last question because we are um, almost out of time and I don't want the us man, to get yeah. behind. Um, there was two there maybe. Yep. Yeah. question is a bit related to um, the ladies, what the lady said um, mm -hmm. just a minute ago. Um, I'm still quite new in this country. I, I grew up in Bulgaria and I was raised with solfege. Yeah. So theory knowledge was taken for granted. Basically, yeah. if, you, if you played an instrument, you, you are uh, by definition literate. Yeah. Uh, now in this country, I'm, ha I'm having to, I, t I teach and uh, I'm constantly being asked to help GCC students with their composition. Yeah. And I must admit, I'm still struggling to see the point of this exercise. What, the, the, <laughs> the, the, the kids doing writing kids pieces? Kids doing composition, yeah. compulsory. I would not have a problem if it were optional, yeah. which means if it comes from within, I would applaud. Yeah. But kids being forced to compose yeah. when they cannot. Yeah, well, I, I sort of agree with you, really. But I don't know what the solution. I mean, I think it's a bit easy. And also, the other problem that you're talking about. I mean, I I, I did solfege because actually John Lambert, my teacher, was studied with Nadia Boulanger, and so she, you know I had all that. And my kids, funny enough, took my daughter playing the double bass. She's doing London, London colour strings, and that's solfege. And so it is good. <laughs> Really no, but it's, yeah, but it's sort of there's an element of it though. Yeah. Well, I, I you know, that's, that's movable the, door. I'm sorry. Yeah, but well, I recognise I recognise some of it. From, yeah. From the, yeah, but there's a connection, and and I know that that's got that went to um, to um, not Hungary to um, Finland. But the thing mm. is that that the, the problem I think with the composition things you're talking about is that, and it's the thing I mentioned earlier, the Sibelius software is that what happens is that, that people aren't using their ears, they're just putting it on the computer. Mm. And, and that happens with a lot they're of... They're done using their brains. Yeah, which well, is human a lot, that happens with a lot of composers. I, I, I sometimes ban, you know, and I should, don't think you should ever say this, because my teacher, 
Jean Lambert, said I, no composer should work at the piano. Um, and, and of course, saying no to somebody yes. is like a red rag because, you know. <laughs> and then I quote, well, if you think of it, Haydn, yes. Wagner, um, Stravinsky. I mean, that, you couldn't get three more major composers than that. All, all wrote at the piano. Mm -hmm. So I think there's sort of a nonsense. But at the same time, with software, it's a bit different because you're sort of working things out. But with software, um, you, know, you, you, the, you know, things like ranges of instruments. When I was a kid, I learned the ranges of instruments. Um, and now I, th I get composers coming in, and especially when you audition, because I do a lot of auditions for college, and, and they don't know the range of the instruments because they do it on Sibelius, and of course, if it, if goes, it goes red. red it's, yeah, it's too, high, too low. Yeah. No, it's, and it, 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 it's, yeah. it's scary. Yeah. So, I mean, in the sense that the, the, you know, the, 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 they're not composers when they're doing these things, but that's what they're... So it's all a bit... And they, use, they don't use their ears. For instance, like pizzicato on... On Sibelius sounds too loud if you heard it live with players, you know. So I'm glad I wasn't, I didn't grow up in the computer, you know, mm. with software really, because I was, you know, 16. I think computer studies came in a year after I, I, I left, uh, left school. Mm. So, I mean, you know, this is a bit of a problem, I think, for, for, for GCSE students and, and, and composers mm. as well. Mm. It's, it's a bit too easy. You can, you can, and you can, and quite often with software, you're just patching bits and repeating bits, and it, it's not. Proper composition. And it affects the way that you're thinking about the music. Yeah. But, um, yeah. We're going to have to stop, I'm afraid, because I'm conscious that you have a full day ahead of mm. you um, that I don't want us to get behind on. But, Mark, thank you so thank much you. for talking to us this That's morning. Very much. <laughs>